I love seeing the numbers Hello. of people entering. This is really exciting. Hello, everybody. Hello there. Alan, can you start the trend from last time? Hi, this is Alan from the USA. Hi, it's Alan Brown from Miami, Florida. How about that? And I'm Michal Limon from Israel. Caroline, are you going to join me or not? And I'm Caroline Casey from Ireland. Woo! Hello, Michael Bichler from Austria. Hey there. Yeah, I am, I am Raman, Shankar Raman from India. This Amazing. is Michael outside of Washington, D.C. Aaron Kaufman from Washington, D.C., representing the Jewish Federations in North America. Great. Yvette Gibson from Washington, D.C. Howard Blast, New York. Europeans, we have a lot of U.S. guys. Come on, I can't hear you. You've got Catherine Hello. from London. Perfect. Catherine from Austria. Hello, everyone. This is Yossi Benger from Israel. Hello. It's Susanna Hello. from Poland. Hello. Thank you, everyone. From, from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Uh, greetings from Germany. <laughs> Amazing. Hi, this is, uh, Neha from India. Chris Neha from Washington, D.C. This is David Lepowski from Toronto, Canada. Wow. This is Danny Human from Ann Arbor, Michigan. This is Brian Brown from New York. Perfect. So we have already um, about 121 participant and counting, uh, entering slowly. Um, I will give it another minute for everybody to enter, and then we'll start and everybody will join us as we go along. Jamie. Jamie. Hi, Alan. Annie. Okay, guys, so we are ready. Are we ready? Yes. Great. Yes, we are ready. Okay. Oh, hello, so, Warner from Germany. And again, I see that the light is really um, uh, in my face, so I apologize. Caroline, your lighting is great. I'm telling you. Okay, guys, so. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends where you're at. Um, um, basically, we set the time according to Christopher uh, from California, um, but, uh, and we're all lining up, Christopher, as you see. Uh, so whoever doesn't know me, I am Michal Rimon, and I'm the proud CEO of Access Israel. Israel. Usually I have a whole mantra, I'm going to stop here because we have a very, very loaded uh, schedule for this webinar. Um, and I must say, I'm also Michal Rimon, the friend of uh, Commissioner Victor Kalisi. I don't know if he's already with us or not, from New York City. He was one of the speakers last time, and among other things, he shared with us guidelines on how to conduct accessible webinars. Now, the whole idea of this webinar and this network is to share and learn from each other. So, Victor, I'm learning, and what you guided me is that I need to begin by asking everybody, can you hear me? And please, if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know through the chat and I will slow things down, okay? Everybody, yeah, we're doing okay? Yep. Great. So it is also very important to me to say at the beginning, great, great thanks to our amazing partners and the international network that we've been creating together uh, Zero Project, The Valuable 500, ONSIG, IAAP, Phaser, Google, Enable, G3ICT, Austrian Association Supporting the Blind and Visually Impaired, Christopher Reeve Foundation, Microsoft, and many, many more. It's an honor and a privilege to work with you guys. If it wasn't for the Corona COVID-19 crisis, many of the participants of these, this webinar would have been in Israel as we speak, enjoying um, the Access Israel 8 International Conference. 
those of you who haven't been to our conference, uh, you should know that at this stage, right now, uh, you would have been after touring accessibly around Israel, participating in a great accessibility technological speed dating event sponsored by Google, where they would, uh, you would be exposed to amazing technologies from all over the world, and you would be participating in experiential events such as the Feast of the Senses Dinner and more. But if I can be frank, at this point, you would also be exhausted. And I'm not making any blames, Ronnie. Uh, but you would be loving every bit of it. Right, guys? I'm seeing a lot of uh, thumbs up. So um, unfortunately, the corona made us postpone the conference, but I really hope that we will use the time to make sure to expand the network and the circles that we have. And the next time we meet face-to-face, -face, we will make our meeting even more powerful and more effective and with more members and more participants. To those who are new in the group, welcome to a network of friends that share the same values and obligation to the cause. Joining together, making inclusion and accessibility a reality, and by this, promoting so many of the United Nations SDGs aimed at making sure we're leaving no one behind. Our network has expanded and we already received great feedbacks from the last webinar we had, uh, and this is the whole purpose of the idea. Please feel free to contact the speakers that you see here, the presenters, the other participants. The communication is the whole key for the success of this network. Following today, today's webinar, you will receive a link to a mini site that can be used to share Corona and post-Corona pro uh, projects, promoting accessibility and inclusion to all. And as time goes by, we see that among participants of this network, we're talking about almost 60 countries from all over the world, there are already differences in the stage each country is in with regards to the coronavirus, the COVID-19. Some of us are still deep in the restrictions and the quarantine regi uh, regimen. Others have loosened up a little bit on the restrictions, and some of us feel that we're almost back to normal, or at least post-corona normal. While we might live in different countries, climates, environments, and cultures, we still need to remember what we said last time, that we all share a common fact. We all have our own biggest minority, which are people with disabilities and the elderly. They are our parents, our siblings, our neighbors, our employers, our friends, the people, and we have to keep them in mind and in the center of what we're talking about. It is our job as a society to make sure that these people are not forgotten at these uh, challenging times, and it's crucial to make sure that all their needs are still met and they are accepted as equals. It is our job to make sure that technology, information, services are accessible to all users of all ages. This is true both during the crisis, but also post-crisis. So let's make sure the largest minority in the world is not overlooked and not unheard. So I'm happy to welcome you all to the second international webinar on accessibility and inclusion, focusing on COVID-19. And the webinar is again close uh, captioned by Verbit, an Israeli technology, based on voice-to-text platform combining AI and human transcribers to provide efficient captioning. And today, the international sign is uh, provided by language people from the USA. Thank you, Lisa. If there are any problems around along this hour, please send a chat privately to Tali Ravid, who will help to you access Israel. access Israel. Sorry, to access Israel, who will help you uh, uh, as we go along. In any case, all those registered will receive a recording of this webinar by email. So let's start, and I'm happy to start with you, Martin. Martin Essel, uh, chairman of the Essel Foundation and uh, guy behind the Zero Project, amazing Zero Project pro program, uh, and a dear inspirational friend to all of us at Access Israel. So please, Martin. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends from all parts of the world. Thank you, Michal, uh, Yuval, and Rami for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, it is a real honor and a pleasure 
We gladly support Access Israel with this amazing series of webinars to vanquish Corona. As always, with the Zero Project, we look to the potentials at the way forwards. And these weeks and months of crisis also bring unique windows of opportunities. Of course, among all the losses, the fears, and uncertain future for so many of us. But change and improvements, they will not happen by themselves. And therefore, there is time of action. And we at the Zero Project are working very hard to review all our services to our innovators, NGOs, politicians, and to our partners from all over the world. We do not know yet how long Corona will torture us and how to find, spread, and support innovations most effective in the future. Although we cannot meet in person currently, we are very working even closer with our partners. In the next month, we will develop new opportunities to working together and collaborate closer as, new, as a new part of the mission of the Zero Project. We are currently digitalizing all eight years of research that we have already with some 560 outstanding innovations, uh, both practices and policies from 123 countries, another 1,000 shortlisted nominations, around 1,000 conference presentations, and more than 10,000 pictures, videos, and many other files. The opportunities to find partners have access to unique expertise or to create meaningful communities throughout the Zero Project will be bigger than ever. And we hope to open this up to you at the end of this year already. Now, let me finish with a call for action for all of us. Please support the Zero Project, call for nomination by nominating outstanding programs products and services from all over the world or by forwarding and sharing this call. You are strengthening the whole community, which is more important than ever. This year, we are looking for outstanding innovations in two fields. First, in employment and second, in ICT from all sectors of society. For the very first time, we are therefore looking for all kinds of ICT solutions, not only related to employment. So please come forward and use this opportunity to reach a worldwide audience of decision makers, uh, opinion leaders and potential supporters. And we all know innovative practices and policies that have proven to work sustainably, uh, also in times like crisis, like now, they are more important than ever. Thank you, and all the very best to all of you. Michal? Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, as always. Okay. And I think I'm a junkie for Zero Project for eight years already, and I um, join your uh, uh, call. Uh, I think it's a, it's a real must, um, especially those busy with uh, accessibility, inclusion, and disabilities around the world. That's the place to be. So, great. And now I will uh, uh, invite uh, Yuval Wagner, the chairman and founder of uh, Access Israel, uh, for his uh, opening remarks. Please, Yuval. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's always exciting for the second time, so I'm, uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, um, so, I'm sure that we can all agree about the importance 
of up to date um, and the reliable of the reliable information, especially when dealing with national crisis. All of us here who work with largest minority in the world also understand the importance of accessibility and especially of accessibility of information in crisis times. Today, I chose to open this second webinar in direct continu continuation to our collective understanding and agreement on the importance of this subject. Those of you who participated in the first webinar will recall New York City Commissioner Victor Calisi when he emphasized on, on this subject. And also the project was that, that was presented by the Austrians, Capito, that showed what they do regarding making information in general and during specifically at this corona crisis, making language or information simple for people at all and people with disabilities especially, and cognitive disabilities even more. As I've mentioned last time, it is our duty to learn and research all that occurred and be better prepared for next time. It's very important, I, I'm really sure that this is something that we should always find a way being prepared better for the next time because something will happen the next time, unfortunately. As of today, the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen many countries using subtitles and sign language in conference, in, in press conferences. But many did not at all. Under these circumstances, I propose we all agree on a goal that we can all stand behind and promote together. We, together, our power. We can make a difference if we join hands and work together. Our voice will not be overlooked if we, look, if we work together in a smart way. We can make a difference all over the world if we call out for accessible information during crisis. Information that will be up to date and accessible to all disabilities. To achieve this goal, this is what we need to do. We need to set up at least one official accessible website with all the information accessible for all disabilities, for all kinds of disabilities. We need also that all decision makers, when they have press conferences, should be accessible in real time, including subtitles and sign language translator, but that's not enough. We have to go a few steps forward we should also demand simultaneous broadcasting with simple language. We'll see later on a presentation on that. Also simultaneous broadcasting with audio description for the visual disabilities mm -hmm. and also simultaneous broadcasting with cognitive linguistics and simplification. All press releases should be updated at real time at all the accessible information centers that are not only websites, also website courses, call centers and alternatives. Because as we know, not everyone have websites and not every one over the globe is accessible to websites. So what is actually an information center in a crisis? It actually have three items. One, of course, is a formal accessible website. Secondly, we need the call center that can assist using various tools 
okay? Of course, the telephone, but not only the telephone because it's not accessible for all. So we need also alternatives to the telephone, which is emails, text messages, Facebook messages, WhatsApp, internet bots, and more. We should also have other alternative solutions like TV, Facebook pages, dedicated applications, and more. We just a couple of days ago on the 21st of May, we had the Global Awareness Day of websites, the GAD Day. It's very important that the website should be accessible with accessible language, with accessible files, that the videos will be accessible, including subtitles and audio descriptive and simple language. Option of screen reading for those that can't read themselves. And of course, accessibility by the WACAN. The call centers and all its alternative methods like email, WhatsApp, and etc., should be slow talking in simple language with no background music. Parents are responding on all alternatives, up-to-date information answers, and options for different languages if needed. This is a proposal for high quality accessibility for all kinds of disabilities, especially in emergency times. We recommend promoting this proposal as legislation of after corona crisis that is occurring in many countries. And also we suggest to examine this as an option to integrate in the, into the UN convention. So I, I, I call for you if you have any remarks, feedbacks, suggestion, question, just contact us and let's work on this together to upgrade the information, especially in emergency crisis, so it's accessible for the biggest minority in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuval. I told you I'm a proud CEO, right? And he's the driving power. So thanks a lot for that. And now I am very, very happy and uh, honored to introduce our keynote speaker for today, um, uh, Congressman Ted Deutsch, who represents Florida's 22nd district, now serving his sixth term in the 116th Congress. He's the chairman of the House of Ethics Committee and a senior member of the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign, of Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, where he serves as the chairman of the Middle East, North Africa, and International Terrorism Subcommittee. Congressman Deutsch, thank you very much for joining us and please, I can't wait to hear you. Unmute, one second. There we go. Perfect. Good? Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And hello, everyone. It is, uh, it's really great to be joining you from the 22nd District of Florida uh, in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, it's, um, this is really inspiring to see this kind of meeting uh, in the midst of, of this pandemic. And uh, I'm honored to be with you. Uh, I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, I thank uh, Martin Nessel and Zero Project, as well as um, uh, Yuval, I'm looking to see where everyone is, uh, Yuval uh, Wagner and, and uh, Michal uh, and Access Israel for hosting this really important event. And I, I thank all of the presenters and, uh, and Yuval, if, um, if I stopped right now, I could simply commit to uh, doing exactly what you just asked, which is to find ways to work together uh, globally to address the really important issues that you just raised. Uh, I am proud to represent South Florida in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, I'm proud to be a champion for people with disabilities and to fight for human rights, accessibility, and inclusion around the world. It is amazing it's amazing to be able to connect with so many of you from so many places uh, all across the globe. I understand we have people, Michal, from over 50 countries, 
uh, joining. And one thing that I've noticed through our current physically distanced world is that our, our virtual connections are expanding. They're growing stronger and in some ways they're even more intimate. The relationships um, I, I think are, uh, are closer and I, um, I appreciate uh, having seen that. Earlier this month, as chair of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East and North Africa, we held a virtual briefing to discuss the crisis in Yemen. Now, normally, a briefing like that, we would have witnesses who were available to travel to Washington. But in this case, we were able to bring in people who were on the ground in Yemen. And it's, it's nice to be with all of you wherever you're tuning in from today. Uh, I want to thank my dear friend, Alan Brown, for inviting me to join you this morning as Director of Public Impact at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Uh, Alan has dedicated himself to expanding opportunities for people with disabilities, assisting families who don't know where to turn, uh, and making our society more accessible and more inclusive. Uh, he and the rest of the team at the Reeve Foundation are doing incredible work to improve the lives of people with paralysis uh, and their families. Uh, I know that Alan's colleague, Kim Beer, will have an excellent presentation for you later today, um, as I'm sure everyone on, at this meeting who knows Alan um, can attest. Uh, simply knowing Alan uh, is to be inspired, and I'm grateful for my friendship with him. Uh, unfortunately, we're all now facing tremendous challenges caused by this COVID-19 pandemic. There have been over five and a half million confirmed cases around the world. Nearly 350,000 people have lost their lives. And whether you or your family have been sick or not, whether you've lost loved ones or have seen loved ones in your community uh, fall to this terrible disease, everyone has been impacted by this horrible virus. And the efforts that we've taken to slow the spread of uh, the novel coronavirus have also had a tremendous, a tremendous impact on our mental health, access to resources, uh, and our economy. We're human, and we are social, and we like to be together, and we find strength in community. But the virus is forcing us to reimagine how we create and maintain those connections. And that's why this is an important opportunity for the accessibility and inclusion movement. The truth is the COVID-19 crisis is exposing a lot of the weaknesses that were already there. Many of the accommodations that we are making now so that everyone can stay safe are things that the, access, that the accessibility community has been fighting for all along. For example, uh, we're using technology right now to connect us around the world. Schools and workplaces have moved online, but many people with disabilities have been fighting hard to get the chance to participate using remote technologies for years. And the question that I think everyone should be asking is, why did they have to fight for something that now everyone is given access to literally overnight? Uh, a, a, another example, and to Yuval's point about accessible websites and, and taking the technology that we have and making, making sure that all of it is accessible uh, is something that I think what we're going through now uh, helps to, to elevate. Uh, another example is the use of online grocery shopping and delivery services. In the United States, accessibility advocates have been fighting for online shopping access to help low-income Americans use their monthly benefits for grocery delivery services. Many people who use these benefits are older. 28% of non-elderly beneficiaries also have a disability. Now, as a response to the pandemic, online access for grocery delivery is finally expanding in the federal, our federal food benefits program. But the point is, it shouldn't take a global pandemic impacting everyone to get people with disabilities the access and inclusion that they deserve. At the same time, we also have to be aware of how this pandemic is having an outsized impact on people with disabilities. People with underlying conditions and compromised immune systems are at 
higher risk of serious illness caused by COVID-19 and access to healthcare, prevention services, and, uh, and access to information is more important than ever. And the daily routines that everyone depends on to live happy, productive, fulfilling lives have changed almost overnight. But I, I really believe that we've got to view these challenges as opportunities to improve accessibility. Uh, I serve as the vice chair of the Aging and uh, Families Task Force in the House. And so I, I've been fighting to improve care for the most vulnerable uh, and provide better accessibility in our, our testing programs for COVID-19. In Florida, nearly half of the COVID-19 deaths have been residents or staff at long-term care facilities. And we know that the virus is extremely dangerous when it gets into a, a facility like that. We, we need to invest in long-term care services so that they can meet the highest quality care and prevent outbreaks. Uh, so many, uh, so many of, of uh, the, pe the people facing this pandemic are doing it with staffing shortages in their facility, shortages of protective gear, struggling to help residents maintain social bonds. So we need to ensure that life inside long-term care facilities includes access to technology so that we can reduce social isolation even while we're using physical distancing to keep residents safe. And if we're making access to technology to reduce that isolation a key, we also have to make sure that, uh, that it's fully accessible. Uh, we need to ensure that we make testing available and accessible to meet people where they are. And when people can't drive to drive through testing sites in the United States or wait in long lines miles from their home, we've got to create new ways for people to access health services uh, so that they really are accessible to everyone. Uh, South Florida is home to so many amazing resources, for example, for children with autism spectrum disorders and their families. But many of these programs have been closed uh, and, and limit in-person contact. So telehealth visits are making some of these services available remotely, but we know that that doesn't work for everyone. And, and we've already heard about that here. We, we've got to continue to develop and implement public health tools like testing and tracing and, and supported isolation that will make in-person services as safe as possible so that in this case, kids don't have to go months without the therapies that they need. And as many countries are moving forward with efforts to reopen their economies, we've got to protect workers with disabilities from discrimination while also addressing the new challenges posed by COVID-19. And to that, I, I would just point out here in the States, the Americans with Disabilities Act protects employees from discrimination and requires reasonable accommodations to ensure a safe workplace for people with disabilities. And having safe and accessible and inclusive workplaces is really going to be the key to a successful and healthy economic recovery. And finally, We've got to harness the global resources to pursue innovative new technologies that will help all of us, but especially people with disabilities, recover from this pandemic. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I chair the Middle East subcommittee where I spend a lot of time uh, advocating for uh, strong U.S.-Israel cooperation. And last summer, I passed legislation that would expand that cooperation specifically in health technology. We've now recognized that this crisis is an opportunity to expand cooperation quickly to address things like telemedicine and vaccine research and the development of advanced respiratory devices. Uh, and that's true in, in global cooperation that can yield really positive results. And for those with disabilities, advances in telemedicine make seeing a doctor from the comfort of your home possible. And while many of us remain apart, because of the pandemic, we can't overcome these challenges unless we work together. So now is an important opportunity to learn from the inequities that have been present in our societies long before the pandemic and to renew our commitment to repairing them with accessibility and inclusion going forward. Many parts of our lives are going to look different in the weeks and months and even years to come due to COVID-19. And we have to make sure, we must make sure 
that these changes leave no one behind. Uh, I know that you have an incredible uh, lineup of presenters today. Uh, I thank everyone for your contributions to ensure that we emerge from this challenging time as a more inclusive global community. And I commit on behalf of myself and uh, all of the strong advocates in the United States Congress uh, to find ways to work together on a global level uh, to help ensure that that's the result. And, uh, and I'm really so, so incredibly honored to be with you today. Thanks so much. Thank you very, very much, Congressman. And, and from what I hear about you, and I have heard about you throughout the, the uh, last several months from Alan, uh, I know that when you say something, you mean it and you do it. So uh, I'm looking forward and we are here. And I'm, when I say we, I, I'm talking about the expanded network we, uh, and I have no doubt we'll, that we'll do great things together. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, now, um, I'm now very happy to start our um, a presentation of recommended innovations. Um, and to open it, I'm very happy to introduce Christine Hempfill. Um, uh, Christine is a Managing Director in Open Inclusion in the UK, and she will be speaking about COVID-19 Diary Study Overview. Christine, let's hear you. Thank you, Mikhail. And Hello everyone. Now please, hopefully, you can all see that. Well, thank you for the opportunity today and to follow such um, remarkable opening speakers um, and to share with you some of the insights that we've been gathering over the course of the last five weeks now um, in the UK to, to this community. So about uh, six weeks ago, as we were just it was just beginning to go into lockdown in the uk we realized that this was going to be an extraordinary period impact the communities that we we work with in extraordinary ways and ways that we might not be able to predict or best understand unless we were asking as an inside organization ourselves we understand the importance of asking and understanding where people are at and where the challenges are so we can solve for them so what we've done is we set off a diary study. It's a very small diary study. There is only 13 participants in it, but across um, a very broad range of different access needs to understand how people are living through this period of change, where the challenges are for them, and where um, actually where delights are as well. So, and, and sharing this on a daily basis, either by video or for those who prefer, they can, they can give us a written format, also with photos and screenshots of their day where it's relevant to them. Um, we had six core themes, and uh, which we'll get into in a moment. Now, whether you love or hate uh, Napoleon, he was very good strategically, and particularly in a time 200 years ago of significant change, and I love this quote from him, which was, in today's complex and fast moving world, what we need even more than foresight or hindsight is insight. Whatever we thought we were solving for from the research we had six months ago is not so relevant now. So really trying to understand what's relevant in people's lives today with the restrictions that they've got today and that that will change even in the next two weeks. As you know, was mentioned earlier, we're beginning to kind of open up in different communities at different paces. Specifically, we were looking for how communities of people with different lived experience of disability and the older community were dealing with this, people with specific vulnerabilities to COVID-19 or where the impacts either of the lockdown or of the um, of, of work changes were going to be specifically um, different to them. There's, there's quite a lot of research being done on the broader community and we really wanted to kind of unpick and open up these specific communities. The six themes that we've structured the research around are communication, getting food and basics, health and fitness, work and the impacts on that, finances and leisure and entertainment, having some fun as well and, and mental health in that. We've got, say, a very small cohort, but very broad in terms of their different access needs and the different ways in which they adapt to it. So from mobility, hearing, sight, dexterity, neurodiversity and mental health, um, we have a range of people representing all of those different communities. 
and they adapt to, to their needs in different ways from electric wheelchairs or scooter users, manual wheelchairs, screen reader users, people with service animals, those who use hearing aids and those who use sign language as a preferred communication. We also looked at how people were different in terms of their age, in terms of whether they identified as disabled or just getting older, in terms of who they lived with, whether they lived alone with their spouse, with children of which ages or in a community. Um, and their employment status. So we've got a, a fairly broad range across all of those. Just to note, um, we are a bit biased to females. We've got a very broad range over everything else, but our gender bias ended up being 77, 23. So we are a little bit female biased um, across the cohort. So just to illustrate what we've got, I'll just pick on one theme, which was communication. That was the theme of our very first week. And a couple of the key things that came through over the course of the research to date around this. Obviously, we've all felt this deluge of new approaches to learn. Here we are on Zoom learning, you know, how do we do screen share? How do we get it on and off and move around? Um, actually, they're fairly accessible. We've found that for most of our participants, they've found them reasonably accessible, but the usability when you've got access needs is not so good. So it's interesting, the technical accessibility is there, but there's so much we can do to help improve the usability. And we can do that in structuring way that we're actually doing communication, such as Access Israel is doing here with different formats and, and different ways of communicating and, and checking that it's all working smoothly for people. Um, remote engagement, the comment that, that the Congressman um, you know, Ted Deutsch made before about remote engagement, now everyone needs it, all of a sudden it's become possible. And there's both a frustration in this community, but also an excitement in the community because of that. And people that were excluded from their education, as an example, just one year ago, are now being included in a much more useful and powerful way for them with their needs. And they're really looking to extend that going forward once this period is gone. Considering things like masks and how that communicate that limits communication, particularly for people who are deaf or hard of hearing or have trouble reading people's emotions and, and the sign language that comes from our, vi our visual language. Um, people reaching and communicating differently. And again, we've spoken about that today. Adapting to abnormal um, something that the disabled community, people who have got lived experience of different health conditions and disabilities can be much more used to and, and actually in some ways are settling into different ways more quickly and can be learned from. Um, you know, we can, we can learn from that ourselves and desiring for remote uh, engagement beyond COVID as we've mentioned. Just a couple of things to, to speak from the participants. Um, someone with BSL who said communicating with others via video conference system, when people talk over each other or the broad break round breaks down, it makes it difficult for me to see what my interpreter is signing because the video freezes. I felt like an outsider not being able to participate uh, fully. Um, and someone who is dyslexic and dyspraxic mentioned that while I thought this experience, what I learned through this experience is I'm probably quite antisocial. I'm an introvert. I quite like having time on my own. I can't face another video call or sitting over the laptop again. So just thinking about different formats of communication. I won't go through all of these in, in you know, just because of time. We're doing mood maps as well. There's two dips in this particular individual's mood map. That was when his broadband, which is such a critical element of communication, dropped out or became difficult and, and his sign language interpreter was freezing. So that really limited his communication. Um, just in terms of takeaways, I guess for any organisation who's interested getting insight from the edges of experience from people with more specific and more significant needs is where those insights are going to be most diverse from each other and are going to provide much more um, ability to support and learn from for organizations so if you if we're going to get a little bit of uh, insight a little bit from the edges is more powerful from the inside again just to go to communication what we've done is we're beginning to package what we've found in the challenges into what we can do for that in terms of solutions. So thinking about the hook for organizations, how they can communicate more effectively and what are the tools or approaches they can use to help make that easier. Just to finish in terms of um, you know, a kind of call to action from this, if anyone's interested in doing a survey like this, sorry, a piece of research like this, 
um, in their own communities. We'd be very happy to share how we've done this and what sort of approach and the protocols and so on that we've got for this. Um, we'd be delighted to see this replicated elsewhere. If you'd like to know more about this particular survey and the outcomes of it, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to share what we're doing. And there's quite a lot more still to come. We're, so far, we've shared the first two themes. We've got four themes to come. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was fascinating. Um, and uh, uh, we are off to our next speaker. Uh, and, and, and here I must tell you, um, uh, you know, in Israel, we were very busy with uh, uh, remote studying in uh, websites and in uh, all kinds of uh, um, uh, applications. And um, when I started speaking to uh, the, the speakers before this, uh, uh, this uh, webinar, it was amazing to hear how different countries experience it differently because of their level of technology or uh, uh, availability of computers, etc. And uh, our next, speak next speaker is from Rwanda. Um, uh, his name, and this is a great challenge uh, to say it correctly, and I apologize if I won't be able to uh, pronounce it correctly, Jean-Pierre Netsiriayo. Uh, I hope that I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. He is uh, the director of one of the centers of HVP in Gatagara, Gikondo, in Kigali, Rwanda. And uh, he will show us, uh, share with us a project on how um, uh, they dealt with the coronavirus crisis via other means, not only the internet. So please, Jean-Pierre, we're all ears. So, Jean-Pierre, unmute yourself and share your screen. If you need us to share your presentation, mm -hmm. just let us know. One second. Okay, let's see. Jean-Pierre, we can't hear you. Can you uh, try and speak and we'll make sure we can hear you? Jean-Pierre? You know he's here, here. I see him here. He's just, uh, maybe there's a bad connection. So I suggest, uh, Jean-Pierre, we will, if you're hearing me, we will go on to the next speaker and then get back to you as soon as you are reconnected because it is fascinating to hear what you have to say. Um, so in order not to um, uh, delay it more, I will uh, invite our next speaker, uh, Kim Beer, Director of Public Policy and National Par uh, Paralysis Resource Center in the Christopher Reeve Foundation at the, from the USA. Kim will tell us about advocacy and education during the COVID-19. So please, Kim. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I want to say thank you so much for Tali because I think she's going to um, share my slides. I am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a second. It will be on. And I'll give you the remote control. Okay. One moment, everyone. In a second, Kim will be able to also control. The... Thank you. Okay. Kim, you're supposed to be able to. Uh, move okay, so I'll test it. Let me just test it. Don't work. Okay, so. It will maybe take a second, but then I can move your slides and you can just you can start. peek and start. Okay. I'll be good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kim Beer, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, which is based in New Jersey in the United States. And I am based in Washington, D.C., not very far from the U.S. Capitol and the United States Congress in the United States. But thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to talk about what the Reeve Foundation has been doing to provide our critical services through the National Paralysis Resource Center during this public health emergency. And also to make sure that the needs of the paralysis community are represented in any legislation 
the United States Congress is working on to address the extremely complex and very dire aspects to this crisis. We can do this work through a cooperative agreement, a uh, cooperative grant with the Administration for Community Living, which operates within the United States Health and Human Services Department. This is a competitive grant. The Reef Foundation has been awarded since 2002. If you could advance the next slide, that would be very helpful. The National Paralysis Resource Center, the NPRC, provides the most comprehensive knowledge, tools, and services for individuals impacted by paralysis, mobility impairments, spinal cord injury through our dedicated information specialists, a substantial quality of life grants program, peer and family support program, and a military and veterans program. The Resource Center has provided hundreds of thousands of individuals living with paralysis their families and their caregivers with useful life-changing and often life-saving information. It is a priority of the Reef Foundation to ensure that individuals living with spinal cord injury, paralysis and mobility impairments have access to the resources and tools necessary to live life to their fullest abilities by participating in their communities and living independently. I would also like to note that our information specialists who really serve as our front line in our foundation are able to provide assistance in over 170 languages through a third party translation service. Many of our materials are also translated in several different languages. So we're able to help anyone in the world. Next slide, please. In this difficult and uncertain time, we also stand ready to assist any individual who may need our services during this COVID-19 public health emergency. The health and safety of the paralysis community are our utmost priority. The Resource Center has been offering educational webinars, tips for caregivers, and coping strategies for the foreseeable future. We are posting daily blogs and updating our COVID-19 fact sheet as we learn more. Additionally, the foundation encourages the paralysis community to post questions or concerns about COVID-19 on our online Reef Connect platform or to contact one of our information specialists who are experts and are ready to help. Our recommendations are in line with the United States CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines, which are continually updated, especially since many United, uh, US states are reopening in phases. And the last slide, please. Lastly, I would like to focus a little bit of time on how the Reef Foundation is engaging our community to communicate their needs to Congress. I want to acknowledge that Congressman Deutsch has been a steadfast and tireless champion for the paralysis community and the Reef Foundation, and I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank him for his efforts. Congressman Deutsch has been very busy since the beginning of this pandemic, not only communicating with his constituents, but also working very hard in Congress. There have been three phases of congressional action taken in response to this pandemic. Congress is now working on phase four. As infections rise and we see very concerning levels of unemployment and states and localities are taking various approaches to reopening. A couple of weeks ago, the United States House of Representatives voted on legislation which contains more than three trillion, trillion, three trillion in spending on new measures to address both the health and economic consequences of the pandemic. Right now, the US Senate is in a wait and see approach, and so the fourth phase has been stalled. The Reef Foundation works with many disability focused organizations, and we've been in constant communication with each other and have built a unified message to share with the US Congress. The Reef Foundation utilizes a two prong approach to encourage our community to stay in contact with Congress. So, first, we recruit interested parties mostly through social media, but also through newsletters and word of mouth to join our online advocacy network through an online platform called Phone to Action. We have nearly 7,000 advocates and our goal is to reach 10,000 by the end of 2020. Through this platform, we send out action alerts to advocates in real time with a template to share their opinions with their representatives and senators as they consider legislation. 
During this pandemic, Reeve advocates have sent over 4,000 emails with their personalized stories to Congress, advocating for increased funding for community-based resources, funding for direct service professionals and their home health care workers and their agencies, protective equipment for themselves and their family care providers, and improvement to paid leave provisions specific to persons with disabilities, and directives that newly, as we've all been talking about, newly available public health information that must be accessible uh, to everyone. Our second approach is through our Regional Champions Program. The foundation recruits a network of regional champions, which is a highly select group of, we're around 40 now, people who are engaged and passionate about educating Congress about the needs of the paralysis community. They serve as legislative first responders and they develop relationships with their congressional staff and members of Congress to ensure that their needs are represented and that those offices understand what it's like to live as a member of their community with paralysis or disability. It is our goal that every regional champion, their story, and uh, we also train them not to only understand how Congress and civic engagement works, but also to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance to each regional champion so they feel confident in developing relationships with their uh, members of Congress, senators, and staff. These relationships are vital as Congress relies on constituents to keep them up to date on their needs and personal stories. We believe this is an effective way to keep Congress and the community connected and informed in real time. These champions have been very active during this crisis and we are so grateful for their time and dedication, even when they face their own struggles and fears navigating COVID-19. Happy to answer any questions. And again, I'm so grateful to have been part of this presentation. Uh, here. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, thank you very much, Kim, um, um, uh, for the work, great work that your organization is doing all year round and uh, specifically during these times. Uh, and we definitely have uh, uh, a lot to learn from that. Um, I am, um, uh, I understand now that uh, Jean-Pierre is ready. Um, I am going to uh, uh, call all speakers. Please, please, please uh, adhere to the amount of minutes we said because uh, uh, we want to hear more and more about you. Every time I want to hear a lot, uh, I can hear an hour of each one, but we have uh, a busy schedule. Uh, so Jean-Pierre, uh, please uh, let yourself be uh, heard. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Here in Kigali, we are in uh, evening hours, and uh, that's why I say good afternoon to everybody. My name is Jean Pierre, and uh, I am uh, working for HVP Gatagara. Gatagara is uh, a center working for persons with disabilities in Rwanda. Uh, Gatagara is uh, uh, the pioneer of the centers working for persons with disabilities in Rwanda. And I have been following what have been said by other participants. And then my addition information is going to be focused on how we are providing information to person with disabilities, including children with intellectual disabilities. As you know, a person with physical disabilities should be able to understand and see what is uh, uh, passing as information on TV and radio. Because in the other countries, I have understood that you are, say, you are saying uh, about internet, Facebook, uh, accessibility through uh, WhatsApp, you know. But here in Africa and especially in Rwanda, not everybody has access to internet so that you can browse information from WhatsApp, from Google, from whatever. That's why the government of Rwanda, uh, in partnership with uh, HVP Gatagara, we have been sitting together to create a way that we can communicate to our people using the national television and the national radio, whereby our teachers are sitting together to prepare lessons, model lessons that will be broadcasted through the television and the radio. Once you are preparing these lessons, we are communicating to parents of children because we assume that children with intellectual disability will not be able to sit and focus on the television. 
So to access, to provide them accessibility with information, we have uh, created that method to use the television where the teachers will communicating to their parents and their parents now will be able to help their children. Because of COVID-19, schools are closed. We are not able to, to help our learners at school. That's why we have uh, created another alternative way to access them with television. Uh, my presentation is uh, a bit long. I don't want it to take your time, but uh, we have uh, some other activities that we have conducted during this, uh, this period of uh, COVID-19. Uh, in Africa, and especially again in Rwanda, uh, many of the families having children with disabilities are extremely poor. And uh, because of the limitation of accessibility to job or to work, they have suffered from uh, uh, nutrition. Their children would not be able to have food and uh, that affected too much uh, these families. That's why HVP Gatagara has uh, established a way to communicate to these parents to support them morally and uh, psychological support. Uh, again, we have uh, carried out some visits in the community to assess what is going on because uh, people were not be able to move, but as, as Gatagara, we have been given a permission to access our beneficiaries into their communities. So we have observed that among the, among the families where children with abilities are, especially children with autism and children with hyperactivity, there were a bit discussion with the parents and their siblings to know how to cope with these children. So we have noted that in the family there is a conflict between children and uh, their families. And uh, we have uh, installed a way to, to conduct counseling and, and guidance to these parents so that at least they understand how they must cope with their children. We have established a, a new services called CBR or community-based rehabilitation. Because transportation was very difficult for people to come from their home to access the, the rehabilitation services. The center has established another opportunity to them where we have sent our CBR agent in the community to help these children with disabilities to access rehabilitation services. Of course, by providing rehabilitation services, we have been providing also information about COVID-19. Um, Impact that was created is like uh, our beneficiaries now were suffering shortage of rehabilitation services. But now, by this support of rehabilitation in the community, uh, children with cerebral palsy mostly, they have gained some more physiotherapy sessions. Children with autism and uh, other children with having learning disabilities. Now they are being helped by teachers through television and the children with visual impairment. Gatagala has given booklets translated in Braille to facilitate them to read and to access information through Braille. At the end of the day, children with uh, hearing problems, they are getting information from the interpreters that are able to translate information on the television and the radio by using sign language interpretations. Without delaying, I will say that in Rwanda, children with disabilities mostly were uh, privileged from information like they appear without disabilities. But so far so good because we are seeing a way to provide information to them using national television and the national radio broadcasting. So by ending, I can say now we are uh, in a shortage of some preventive material against COVID. The Ministry of Education now is asking us to see if we can take back children with disabilities to benefit rehabilitation services. But we don't have enough preventive material to be protected against COVID. 
Uh, another thing that we need to have now is to, to have uh, accessibility to phones in the families to communicate through phone online to tell the parents what they need to do and to understand their problems with the children so that we can be able to provide a support where necessary online. I don't want to maybe take another time yeah. because I should have uh, given you much information. Let's meet over here and I thank you for your time too. Thank you. Jean-Pierre, thank you very much. It was fascinating. Uh, and uh, I must say that I have the worst job here uh, because, uh, again, I, I, uh, I would prefer that you keep talking and to hear and learn more. Uh, but uh, again, the, the presentation will be uploaded in, uh, in the link to the website that we're going to send you guys. So we will be able to learn more, hear more and connect directly and learn more. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, amazing and very inspiring. Our next speaker is Professor Shira Yelon Chaimovich from uh, uh, Israel. She's the Dean of Students in Ono Academic College, head of the Israeli Institute on Cognitive Accessibility of Agudat Ami and Ono Academic College. And she will talk about audio simplification, accessible news broadcast. Shira, here you go. Thank you. We don't let up that we continue to monitor that if there is. One second. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michal. And um, as you said, my name is Shira. I'm from Israel, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Um, I will actually go quite briefly through my first slides because the previous um, speakers have actually done my job for me, uh, both Yuval and some of the other speakers. Um, talked about one of the major challenge of the COVID-19 or coronavirus or corona, wherever, however we call it, and that's the information challenge that we are all facing globally. And the major information challenge, the way that I see it, is the fact that we um, have to convey a lot of information rapidly changing um, to very uh, variable group of, of populations and, and audiences and we have to do it in a way that is not only um, because they, they are interested or curious or need the knowledge, but because they actually need to go into action. They need to be able to understand what's going on and to act according to the um, rapidly changing regulations and uh, instructions that in a way is crucial, not only on a personal level, but also on a general and even global level for all of us um, to overcome the coronavirus. So as we just heard about using the, the television and we are all exposed to many news conferences and news briefs and many other things that, that uh, where authorities are trying to convey uh, this important um, information but what happened is that this information often misses um, marginalized uh, population, including people with cognitive disabilities. Um, and I don't know if you know, but people with cognitive disabilities are, it's the second largest disability among people with disabilities. Uh, it comprises about 5% of the general population and uh, whether we talk about people with intellectual disabilities, what we heard about right now, brain injuries, head traumas, learning disabilities, um, and many others. And they often have difficulty understanding the common modalities used, such as the press conferences. And there are many measures that are being applied today, such as Capito that Yuval mentioned from the previous um, webinar. But however, until now, no solution existed for real time presentation of information in an accessible manner. And that is where our project comes into play. And what we've been doing over a couple of years, and now we had a chance to do it even more so, is simultaneous audio simplification, which is real time translation into plain language. And what simultaneous audio simplification, what we do when we do that, we are doing real-time editing, um, interpreting, 
and translating into uh, plain language. And in this way, people with cognitive disabilities can, for example, watch the same broadcast as everybody else, but they can hear the information in a way that they can understand. And that enables people with cognitive disabilities, the elderly, um, non-native speakers, to take part in a lot of things such as um, broadcasting movies, conferences, and, and other things. And during the, the COVID-19, um, what we've had the opportunity of actually um, doing a month uh, long of providing the evening news, the Israel um, uh, public uh, broadcasting Khan 11, uh, we provided the evening news uh, every evening for a whole month, the month of April, which in Israel was like the major outbreak of the COVID-19. We had a team of simultaneous audio simplification, um, simplifiers that provided daily news broadcast. Um, and we had a designated YouTube channel, which I have to say is not the optimal um, option in terms of being accessible, but that, that is what we have available right now. Uh, the project was developed by the Israeli Institute on Cognitive Accessibility uh, in collaboration with uh, AIC, which is the International Organization of uh, Conference Interpreters and supported by the Ruderman Foundation and mainly initiated by Khan Digital. And that was amazing for us when we were able to do it day by day and we had about 60,000 people uh, watching us over the, um, uh, the course of this time. And we in, that enabled us to actually let people have the information in a timely manner like everybody else. Now, unfortunately, all of what we've done so far has been in Israel and so in Hebrew. And I realized that bringing one, an example from one of our broadcasts wouldn't be so accessible in the current audience. So I created a little demo of somebody we've actually heard from just a little while ago, Senator Ted Deutsch. And what we're going to see right now is a very short example from an interview with the Senator Deutsch on the coronavirus, first in his own words, and then accompanied by audio simplification. And I really hope it works. Perfect, Shira, we'll do really just a gist of it, really a little bit. Uh, I... One second. It will be there in one second. Okay, I just pushed the wrong button. We don't want to just leave the house. We, we want to do it safely and we want to do it in a way that's going to allow um, a lot more opportunity for people who have been decimated economically uh, you, as a result of this him? pandemic. And so that's, that's my focus right now is, is as things start to slowly reopen, yes, yes. Uh, that we don't let up, that we continue to monitor that if there is an outbreak, uh, we can ratchet things down and that there is planning in place to help okay. keep everyone think, safe. Okay, and now you're going to hear it with audio simplification, the exact same. We want to be able Sorry. to start leaving our houses again, but we want to be safe from the coronavirus. We want to make it better for people who lost so much of their money because of the coronavirus. So that is what I'm working on. That is what I think is important. Now that we okay. slowly start we going back to routine, we have to be careful. So if many people are sick with Corona again, we have a plan. We know how to keep everybody. Okay, so basically what I wanted to, to let you know is that while simultaneous simplification is not simple, you need the expertise, you need the knowledge, um, and you need the professionals to do it, but it can be done. And not only could it be done, but it should be done. So nobody will be left behind. Just Thanks. like the motto for your um, webinar. And I'll be very happy to share uh, what we've been doing with anybody who's interested and help promote this uh, important. Uh, Perfect. 
Thank you very, very much, uh, Shira. And again, uh, one of those lectures I would love to have a whole hour of. Um, um, we are making a short, uh, a small change in the, in the order of speakers, but uh, I am more than happy to introduce um, uh, our returning speaker, Christopher Patnoy from uh, Google, to present some new things from Google. Christopher, please. I, I can't share with you. I'm trying to get out. Yeah. While you're doing that, I want to thank Michal. I want to thank, Michelle. Michelle. I wanna thank um, Yuval for inviting me and giving me, give me the opportunity to present again. I'm a huge fan of the work that's being done here, and I, I'm glad to have this opportunity. So, what I want to share is just a quick recap of our most recent updates, things that we shipped just last week. So I don't think it could be much more fresh. So here are a handful of the things that we shipped with as a part of the global accessibility. Can you please speak a little slower? Please speak a little slower. Thank you. Okay, I'm running out of time before I have to leave, but I'll, I'll do my best. So accessibility's mission is integral to Google. So integral, it, it is even in our mission statement, which is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. So let's unpack this a bit. The world's information means more than just what's already on your device, but also designing for experiences to make the real world more inclusive and participatory. And this becomes especially important in the times of COVID-19. So today, I'm excited to tell you about four features. The first is a feature that we're rolling out in Google Maps that makes wheelchair accessible information more visible for people who need it accessible places in maps. Today, there are over 130 million wheelchair users worldwide. For these people, a simple task such as finding some place to go quickly becomes a cumbersome process to understand what amenities are offered, and even if it's possible to go inside. Imagine making plans to go someplace only to arrive and, and not be able to enter or access the restroom or even seat. So the problem is unfortunately even more prominent today with COVID-19, making each trip to a grocery store or a pharmacy a critical moment. Well, within each day, Google Maps receives 20 million contributions from reviews to ratings to updated street names or addresses. And we have people contributing accessibility information, telling us whether a place is accessible or not. In fact, Today, Google Maps has wheelchair accessibility information for more than 15 million places around the world, and this number has more than doubled since 2017. Over the past year, speaking with people who use wheelchairs, including our own co co-workers, we were, we were made aware of the difficulty that they faced in easily finding information that we already have, and we realized that we could build it in a better way so it would make it easier to find this information. So, as of now, people can start to opt in to see wheelchair accessible information up front on Google Maps in Android and iOS. And through this, we hope to make it, make it, we hope to make people faster and more informed, making it easier for them to make better decisions. So let me show you how this feature works. First, you have to navigate to your settings and you, so you open up settings and then open up accessibility settings, and then you enable this new accessible places functionality. Once the setting is on, users can see a wheelchair icon in the search results that highlights if a place has an accessible entrance. Until now, you've actually had to go in and, and open up the, 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 the page for a given uh, site, and now it's there on the search page. Additionally, um, in the expanded search results, users can see accessible amenities offered as such as restroom, seating, or parking. This feature is starting to roll out in the US, Japan, Australia, and Great Britain, with more countries on the way. And also this week, we're rolling out an update that allows people using iOS devices to more easily contribute accessibility information, joining the millions of users who have been sharing this kind of accessibility information on maps. Next, I'd like to talk about a new application that we've created called Action Blocks. The idea for this product started with one of our colleagues at Google in Italy, Lorenzo Caggioni, who has a brother with Down syndrome. Lorenzo's brother loves to listen to music, and Lorenzo wanted to give him a way to play the music he wanted whenever he wanted. So Lorenzo designed a series of physical switches or buttons that when pushed would send a command to a Google Assistant, 
And now his brother can listen to whatever music he wants simply by tapping a button. We wanted to think of how we could make the same technology that Lorenzo had built for his brother more accessible to people on their phone. Not just for young people with disabilities, but also for older people or who may have more difficulty remembering and learning new interfaces because of age-related cognitive decline. So we started working with therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists with organizations that provide care and actual users. We spent time along users with dementia, Down syndrome, and age-related cognitive decline to learn how we could build a technology that is helpful. And many of us have family members with cognitive conditions, so there's a personal angle for many of us as well. There are several steps that people have to, to make in order to access anything on their phone. For example, to call someone, you need to unlock your phone, remember who you're calling, locate it, open your contacts, search for the name of the person you're looking for, select the right number, and then hit the proper icon to call them. For someone with a cognitive disability like dementia, they may not be able to remember or complete each of those steps. They could get confused on which app they should locate. They may not remember how to get to the contact they need to call or proper how to properly place that call. So Action Blocks provides a customizable button on the user's home screen and with one tap completes all of the steps at once. You just need to unlock your phone, tap on a button of your home screen that has already been customized with your mom's photo named Call Mom, and your mom will be called without needing any additional apps. Cognitive disabilities, like all disabilities, are vast and diverse from dyslexia to autism to dementia, and I'm really excited that Action Blocks is just the first step of many that we are exploring ways where our technology can be more helpful for people with cognitive disabilities and differences. We will absolutely continue to do more in this space. Next, I'd like to share some updates about some of our more, most popular um, technologies, trans, live transcribe and sound amplifier. We have four products actually, and, and services that are designed for the, the deaf and hard of hearing community on Android. And last week we released updates to two of them. We have live transcribe and then live caption, which is part of Android, which provides captions for any of your content. Sound amplifier, which I'll talk about, but also hearing aid support. In, in the latest version of Android, you can actually stream audio from your smartphone directly to your hearing aid. So first, Live Transcribe. For those who don't know about Live Transcribe, it's an app on Android that transcribes spoken text in over 70 languages with sound event detection, self-correcting transcripts, and typed responses for those who may choose not to speak. In terms of new features, you can add custom words in order to help Live Transcribe better understand your proper names or unique technology that's important to you. Next, we are working to make it more helpful by alerting people when, some, when someone is trying to get their attention. So you'll be able to set your phone to vibrate when your name is called. This way, if someone's speaking outside of your field of vision, you'll instantly know it. Also, Live Transcribe now supports the ability to, to do keyword searches in the transcripts that you make. And finally, we now support more languages, including Albanian, Burmese, Estonian, Macedonian, Mongolian, Punjabi, and Uzbek. Sound Amplifier also received an update last week. Sound Amplifier lets you use your headphones to amplify the sounds of the world around you. While not a substitute for hearing aids, this feature can be helpful when you need clearer audio. Previously, Sound Amplifier required wired headphones. And as of now, we are rolling out wireless support with Bluetooth. We hope that this will make it easier to use Sandbot Sound Amplifier and with your favorite wireless headphones. In addition, we know that sometimes you might need a boost of volume when you're watching your favorite YouTube video or listening to songs in YouTube Music or Spotify. So as of today, it's also now possible to use all of the Sound Amplifier's capabilities with any on-device media, including audio and video, on your Pixel device. Accessibility is part of Google's mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. We hope that these used features are a small step toward that vision, and we hope they are able to make your day-to-day -day communication a little easier for everyone to use in these difficult times. Thank you. Christopher, thank you as always. It's amazing, and I saw, I loved seeing the, the faces of everybody uh, looking and, and, and uh, putting their uh, eyes closer to the screen. Great job, and I can't wait uh, to use it. Um, uh, I am now uh, uh, inviting Honorable Secretary Raman Sankara from India uh, um, to uh, share with us early intervention. Raman? Yeah, hello everybody. I am Sankara 
from Amar Seva Sangam from India. Uh, we are running an organization for persons with disabilities and we believe that disability is not a constraint. We all can live in solidarity with others and disabled person can become a breadwinner in the family. Our fine conviction is that no child should be denied of a schooling experience because of disability. Now that COVID has come and this has caused a lot of disruptions and undoubtedly our organization's efforts to reach out people in rural areas has also suffered in the initial stages. Then we came up with an idea of using our remote technology where we have a GPS enabled mobile app which can be used in combination with the other social media technologies, including the Zoom or Google Hangout uh, uh, teleconference technologies with which we can keep connecting with the mothers and also with the parents and caregivers. The idea is that the child in the rural areas do not miss out the therapy sessions, which are very critical for them. The objective of this daily rehabilitation, that's how we have named it, is to identify access and inclusive challenges of persons with disabilities and provide them with a, a solution that they don't miss out the rehabilitation opportunities. In our area, more than um, uh, 1,600 children with the disabilities are there in the community and more than 300 community workers. There are a lot of persons with disabilities, more than 4,000 people in self-help groups where there are myths running around causing a lot of disinformation about the coronavirus and a lot of anxiety. There is a lot of uh, problems with the accessing the ration, the food, the sanitizers, and so on. And the people are desperate and despondent. And our idea of tele rehabilitation is the combination of our mobile app and also the free technology. The outcomes of that is uh, to uh, make children receive the daily. Prevention without any disruption, engage, and the workers also do not idle and uh, they don't lose their jobs. The persons with disabilities and their families also get educated in the process, and we also want to support them with uh, uh, basic essentials like dry rations and also providing with counseling and so on. So, what they actually do is every worker in the community will I schedule a therapy session with the parents with the application that they have. They already have the children's data in their hands and they have to just select the parent and the child and speak to the parents to fix up a time. Once that is done, a therapy session is started and the check-in process happens in the mobile application. Through the period of the therapy session, the WhatsApp and the telephone connections are enabled and they keep talking and discussing with the parents and the caregivers. This will help them to keep the track and help the, uh, support the parents and the caregivers. A video also is taken once in a while to keep the progression uh, to see how the parents are performing or if they have any doubts. And periodically evaluation also takes place. There are physiotherapists and specialists like special educators uh, who keep uh, tracking these uh, progresses, uh, even though all of them are in their house. They keep tracking and evaluating the children. The Zoom and the other uh, telecommunication or teleconferencing tools like Google Hangouts are being used uh, to connect with all stakeholders. This includes the self-help group members and also the uh, community leaders in the local areas 
and the awareness is given and they demystify, they give confidence to the people and also provide them with uh, whatever uh, doubts they have, they just clear all those doubts as well. A lot of meetings, uh, uh, it gets organized on a very regular basis almost every day with uh, several people joining in uh, through these teleconference tools. There is also a helpline that we have organized, uh, which will help them, uh, you know, to contact us whenever there is an emergency. So usually it is a medical emergency or a family crisis or a desperate need for travel. So average, we get about three calls a day in our helpline services provision that we are doing. And um, the Google folders are the ones which are very useful for us. Uh, we collect the data from the system itself directly and upload them in the Google Drives. And uh, the drive ration also is being um, um, used to provide supply uh, to people in the local areas uh, through the self help group members and our supporting staff. So far, every day, there are about 1,460 odd children get, getting therapy without any disruption. A lot of families are being supplied with ration and more than 15,000 people getting counseling and support. This is the overall architecture of our GPS-based technology. And uh, these are all the screenshots of the reports and the dashboards and the analytics that we get. Going way forward, this uh, has created a new opportunity for us. The parents are happy and comfortable. The fathers are coming out to get involved in the process. And we are able to reach even the most unreached people in this emergency situation. I think this telehealth is going to be the future, even in the normal days to yeah. come. There are any doubts, please be uh, free to ask me questions. Raman, I thank you very, very much. Uh, that was uh, um, uh, inspiring indeed. And again, uh, all the information will be uploaded on the website so you can learn more, you can contact Raman uh, to receive more information uh, uh, from him. Um, yeah. uh, and now I will, I'm very, very happy to present Klaus Hockner, first of all, a great friend and um, the uh, uh, managing director of the Austrian Association Supporting the Blind and Visually Impaired, uh, who will tell us about safe banking in times of COVID-19. Please, Klaus. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and you can ah, see the, like the picture. <laughs> and you can see the slides. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Yeah, yeah, last year, I'm the last obstacle between uh, to 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 uh, Kate, uh, Caroline, I think, and all the people want to hear Caroline, so I will keep it short and simple. I will kiss you. Uh, when I, when I compare it to the others, uh, we, we offer a very simple um, mechanism or a simple uh, thing here in Austria because we noticed that many people sitting at home uh, are not able to uh, to do the the normal businesses, the normal affairs, especially with when they want to go to a bank, for example, or when they want to go out for shopping or all this stuff. Uh, especially when you are in a vulnerable group, it's a problem. Uh, so uh, we brought together. Wait, so no works. Not works. We brought we brought together three partners. Uh, uh, a big bank in Austria, the Bank Austria, which is the which is the biggest one here. Uh, then Halle Mobil. Halle Mobil is um, offers uh, transport for vulnerable people, for people in risk groups, with a train staff. Uh, and the HGB, the Hilfsgemeinde of the Blinden, the, uh, the, the Austrian Association supporting the Blind and Visually Impaired, we decided to support our members. Uh, with an amount of money to be able to go to the bank and to make the bank affairs. Um, the problem is that the travel with public transport uh, is a significant risk for infection for people in the risk groups. So many people don't dare to go uh, to the public transports. Uh, but sometimes it's it's absolutely inevitable to go to the bank to speak, for example, with the person there uh, and to make some things. And when you do, when you're going to the bank, uh, it's also possible to make a short, um, how you say. Um, 
Uh, should we to uh, should we to the next shop if you want to have something to 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 buy, for example, and perhaps to see how uh, the world outside is looking uh, now. Uh, it's not only for persons with disabilities; it's also for all the for the group of uh, vulnerable person persons. It's the for the elderly, for example, and we count about three hundred fifty thousand only in Vienna. Uh, with a total uh, inhabitants of uh, two million persons, and we want to stress out that it's not a call for unrestricted movement without taking into account the social distancing rules. We don't want the people to go out and to spread the virus, but uh, we have we want to uh, offer an alternative for public transport where the risk of infection uh, is very very higher when you when you use public transport uh, and we have here uh, trained staff we have hygienic uh, environment and uh, cars are disinfected after every client so there is no risk of infection and how it works, yeah, I said it before, you contact uh, the Halle Mobil. Normally you have to pay about 75 euros for one trip. Uh, you have to you have to imagine. No? When you're a, a customer of the Bank Austria, you only pay 50, uh, 46, 47 euros. And when you are a member of the uh, Austrian Association supporting the blind, you only pay 20 euros. Uh, and that's all. But I think it's a it's a very useful mean for the people, for people with disabilities, and for the vulnerable group uh, to be connected to the outside world and to to bring them back a little bit of the of the normal life uh, that we all want to have uh, as soon as possible. And that's it. Thank you. I hope I am in the seven minutes. Uh, six. Yeah, you are amazing. Thank you. First of all, uh, uh, you're a great example of simple is perfect uh, because it's, it, as you said, it's not a complicated solution, but it's one that works and really makes a difference. So uh, thank you very, very much for sharing that. Um, uh, now you can take off. Great. Perfect. Uh, now I would like uh, uh, to uh, uh, call, uh, and we are at the end of the webinar almost, so bear with us, and I'm very happy to see many uh, participants still with us. Um, uh, I am uh, happy to invite Fred Augustin, Augustin the COO of Health, and uh, Lisa Wrench from uh, Language People, the CEO of Language People, to share their project with us. And again, thank you for the amazing sign language. So. Uh, very professional, and thank you very much. Hello, good day, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great. So again, my name is Fred Augustine. I'm the COO of Health Incorporated. As you can tell, there's been a significant move to remote video meetings, such as the one that we're in today. The barrier for doing video meetings has all but been eliminated. Post-COVID, we expect to see a significant move to video in other uh, industries as well. And our smart video technology will help organizations to implement business processes uh, in parallel to their face-to-face -face business. Additionally, this situation opened the door for people to experience how powerful collaborating over video can be. Being able to walk across borders and sharing information and resources has helped to mitigate the effects of this worldwide disaster. So who we are is Health Incorporated, which is actually an acronym for Health Education and Learning Technology Holdings, Inc. We're basically a group of friends and business colleagues from all different walks of life who, uh, across the globe actually, who've collaborated to create uh, accessible video platforms to benefit social good. Now, through our sister company, which is Language People, we have spent over the last 10 years to provide over a million dollars of free interpreting services for the deaf over our video platform. So things that many people take for granted, like purchasing a house or a car or uh, making banking transactions or even seeking medical help, we've helped to facilitate that for the deaf. Now, our uh, sister company, which is Language People, our CEO, Lisa Wrench, invented business management process flows that facilitate video calls. We also provide uh, interpreting services for organizations worldwide in every language, 
and we're expanding our video, our patented video software platform to multiple industries for the purpose of demonstrating social good. So we have a shared passion as far as the collaborators are concerned for effecting change uh, in society by implementing the, the model for business as social good. What we intend to do is to partner with NGOs and CBOs to provide them with tools and resources to maximize the effectiveness of serving others. We also want to create meaningful work opportunities for people with special needs, such as call centers for uh, the deaf. We commit a large portion of our profits to partners that invoke social benefit pr programs who provide aid to the most vulnerable populations. So basically when people are using our platform, you're actually helping to fund uh, other projects that would benefit the most vulnerable population on, on the planet. So what makes us different? Well, unlike other video uh, conferencing pr platforms, we've actually invented video uh, software to manage sessions through customized workflows. In other words, we have patented technology to make video calls smart. We also have customizable form fields for efficient data entry. So we provide access to healthcare and educational opportunities on our intelligent video conferencing platforms. Through our new platform, Medio, we offer smart video healthcare, which basically filters and routes people through, uh, filters the right people through the right behavioral steps, such as triage or uh, going from doctor to nurse or even an aftercare customer service. We also empower educators in creating meaningful educational content to facilitate learning across the globe. No video call information is ever lost because we provide a full history of all session interactions. Now, for something that's even more cutting edge, um, if you're an NGO or really any public, public service organization, in emergency situations, our platform will allow you to reach out to other organizations, other agencies, to donate resources to you. This is a game changer. All of our platforms will include also the ability for, uh, to provide foreign language interpretation and interpretation services for the deaf. So we would like to uh, partner, uh, that's, that's our aim is to partner with organizations that provide social benefit uh, programs to the disenfranchised and to the less fortunate to help make the world a little bit more accessible to them. In other words, we want to aim to make the world a better place, one conversation at a time. If you have any interest in partnering with us uh, in any capacity, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. I do appreciate your time and uh, thank you for letting me speak. Great, thank you very, very, very much. Um, uh, and uh, Lisa, you wanted to say something also, or you're all good? I'll unmute myself real quick. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we started building this last year, um, and we intended on uh, phone first on schools. We have schools around the world who want to create content so we could create uniform education for deaf children who don't get um, education uh, opportunities in sign language so we we are we're working with various countries right now to use the profits from my patents in video which are very large and very exciting and also our platform itself and the revenue will generate from that to fund schools for deaf fund job opportunities for disabled populations where normally they would not even get an opportunity to work and we feel that healthcare, education and work are three of the most dignifying and most important things to make sure everyone has the opportunity for uh, one of the exciting things that came out of one of our own meetings is uh, one of our members is a worldwide nutritionist for animals and and agricultural production and our um, 
chief community engagement officer was talking to someone from Africa about the fact that they had no water, they had no, they had the wrong kind of crops for people to eat and feed their animals. And so on our call, we realized that our platform uh, can be used by organizations to bring specialists and experts worldwide together to uh, donate their time and assistance to solve problems worldwide. So one of the uh, social good missions that we will enable is organizations like Access Israel or the other speakers and organizations worldwide to be able to have a collaboration medium so that they can engage volunteerism, they can work on projects together. And because the platform is smart, people will be able to do kind of like meetups on video only with all kinds of intelligence so you can bring people together. One of the things about working on video is it can be very chaotic and it, it's hard to organize. All of that is solved by the patented features of our video program. Right. So thank you, Michal. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, You're welcome. And thank you to the interpreters. Perfect. Thank yeah, you guys very you. much. I wanted to thank them personally. So Susan Emerson, I think she is uh, the uh, uh, international IS uh, uh, signing and Bernard Burford, um, uh, the uh, American Sign Language. And again, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for for doing this and uh, being part of this amazing uh, uh, thing. So uh, guys, I have uh, good news and bad news. The good news is that we are ending. We are towards the end of this uh, uh, session. Uh, and I really hope that uh, the lemonade that we made out of the lemon of Corona COVID-19 tasted as good for you as it did for me. Um, uh, and uh, the bad news is that Caroline was supposed to uh, say a couple of words to end, but unfortunately she uh, uh, had a, another call scheduled. Uh, so she owes us and you know, Caroline, she's a woman of her word and she will be back and she will uh, uh, have her uh, stage. Um, now, uh, I do want to, say, to end with uh, um, uh, three short points. Number one, thank you very much. First of all, for staying, we have more than a hundred uh, people staying, uh, and uh, we had many more uh, throughout this uh, session. And I really, really uh, appreciate every single one of you for being part of this. And I really hope that for the next one, which will be in about three weeks, help us spread the word, help us increase it, and of course, contact us if you have a program or a best practice uh, to share. Please send it to us. Uh, and if you can send it in the next week, week and a half, that would be great. And I promise you uh, to be more, um, uh, to stop at an, a more minimum uh, number of uh, speakers. So we will enable at least a little bit of breathing in between. Uh, each one has a disability. I think that saying no to amazing speakers is one of mine. Of so I apologize uh, for that, but at least we enjoyed uh, this great uh, contact. Um, uh, and um, again, we are going to send you by email uh, right after this uh, um, a session, uh, an email with a survey. Please help us fill, us it, fill it in to make it better, to make it more effective next time, to make it more meaningful. And uh, um, uh, we, can, uh, we promise to, to read all the comments and uh, uh, follow whatever we can. And uh, lastly, um, continue doing good continuing looking at the person. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see you guys in the next webinar uh, in three weeks. So thank you very much. And uh, were there any uh, questions? Cause I don't wanna keep anybody, uh, officially it's over. If you have like a, a quick uh, a question, um, uh, you can feel free to ask. And if not, I will leave with all the amazing comments that I'm seeing in the chat. <laughs> have a great, great day. Uh, night, whatever your time zone is, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Say that we want to suggest a topic. Bye. I'd like you to suggest yeah. speakers Thank you, too. Guys. Not just... uh, it's Goodbye. a great thing that you're mentioning that. I can suggest a topic. It's a great thing you're mentioning that. We are uh, going to publish. We are going to publish um, uh, three topics for the next three sessions, and uh, you will receive it in an email with the recording of this session. And that way, you can really um, uh, make a good fit to what your project is uh, uh, good for. But if you have a good project that is not one of those subjects, please don't stop yourself from sending. First of all, we will be happy to upload it in the website uh, that we are going to share the link with you, uh, with you right after this uh, uh, webinar. Um, so others can read 